Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Plan Code Podcast. I'm Max, and today I'm joined by Alden, vegan Indonesian activist here. We are in Bali once again, sitting outside, enjoying the weather and its beautiful view. Thanks for joining me, Alden. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Awesome. Let's dive straight into it. Why did you go vegan? Because of uh, out of respect for animals, because I value justice, <laughs> I value the truth. <laughs> Uh, before I went vegan, I was a vegetarian for about eight years. So I already cared about animals since a young age. And uh, I thought I had stopped killing animals by not eating them, you know. Like, but um, of course, I still consumed eggs and cheese and drank milk for many, many years. And uh, I was always open to the idea of veganism. But it wasn't until I joined a, a group called Sydney Vegan Club when I was living in Sydney, Australia, that I was exposed to the dairy and egg industries. And uh, yeah, it was just, um, I did my own research, you know, like, and in that group they shared links. And just because I had, had the time to do it, uh, just by reading the, uh, the articles, you know, uh, reading about people's experiences with being vegan and seeing how, uh, how easy it is, you know, um, I just thought, um, oh, like, I can't justify, you know, like, yeah. doing this anymore. And when was this that you're in Sydney? Um, oh, well, I went vegan in uh, 2014. Okay. 2014, yeah. So it's been five years now. Well, 2020 almost, six years. Oh, six yeah. years, yeah. <laughs> Brand new year to come. Absolutely. Yeah. So you went vegan in Australia, vegetarian, eight years before that. Yes. So... Was there a particular documentary or a particular film or a particular book that you read that really made you hit that transition? Because I find it's almost harder for vegetarians to become vegan than for meat eaters to go vegan. It depends on the person ultimately and how, how open they are, you know, like, uh, how adaptable they are. It, it clicked for me just from reading um, facts about the industry, you know, how uh, baby chicks are ground up alive in the egg industry, how uh, male calves are considered useless in the dairy industry and they are shot... Uh, when they were still young, you know, and that alone, you know, was enough for me. Uh, but then, uh, of course, like I continued learning, so I started watching Earthlings, uh, Forks Over Knives yeah. back then. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of documentaries that came out around that time. There was uh, Cowspiracy, Cowspiracy, sorry, Forks Over Knives, Earthlings. Obviously, a bit before that, Dominion recently came Dominion out. Dominion very as recently, well. yeah. For the first like three years, um, w- the first three years I was vegan, I was. Uh, I didn't speak up much about it. I tried to, like, just avoid um, confrontation. Um, I was a silent vegan, basically. Yeah. But I, I kept learning, you know, and I kept uh, watching videos. And it was uh, Gary Urofsky's video, uh, his speech, you know, titled The Best Speech You Will Ever Hear, that, that clinched it for me that it's not enough to simply be vegan, that you have to speak up as well. You know, because uh, for many years, most of us like contributed to this uh, atrocity, you know, to, to these industries. So just by stopping, uh, uh, cont- stopping our contribution um, doesn't help the animals. Yeah, you, know, yeah like you have the negative when you're consuming, neutral when you kind of stop consuming. Exactly. And if you want to go positive, you've got to start actively exactly, making being a active, difference. Yeah. Yeah. I started online, you know, just like speaking up on my uh, social media platforms. And then... Um, in 2017, uh, when I went to the UK, uh, I connected with the local activist scene. Okay. Um, so I started doing like uh, street demonstrations. You know, like, was uh, that with uh, Anonymous for the Voiceless? Or? Anonymous for the Voiceless, okay. also Surge, you know, like yeah. done with Dairy. Um, I did cubes and, I, and then I did protests, you know, and I joined the march, you know. I've joined the march three times now, like every, every summer. Wow. The past. Yeah. And, uh, so you go to the UK every summer? For the past five years. Nice. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So I learned uh, about Anonymous for the Voiceless uh, online, obviously. Yeah. But then I, I started in London. And then I, I took that skill. And then I started my own chapter here in Bali. Oh, so you founded so the Anonymous for the Voiceless chapter in Bali? In Bali, yeah. The Bali oh, chapter. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, it, when did you found it? It's been going great. It's uh, May of 2018. Awesome. So yeah. year, How yeah. many uh, members do you have? Oh, it's always different. That's the thing about Bali. Yeah. It's a hub. So... Uh, people come and go naturally, and uh, so whoever 
uh, whoever vegans, whoever wants to be active in Bali, they usually contact me and I usually... Oh, that's awesome. So anyone's yeah. listening, traveling to Bali, wants to get involved in a cube of truth or wants to get involved in some activism, you know who to contact. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm quite lucky, yeah, uh, yeah. It averages around eight people every cube. Okay. So we do uh, at least two cubes a month. That's yeah. awesome, yeah. And is it mainly, uh, you said foreigners, or is it mainly locals? You have much of a local participation in the, um, the movement? At the beginning, it was mostly foreigners, yeah. but... Um, the local activists have always been active from, from the beginning. You know, they mostly come from this uh, meditation group. Okay. Yeah, called Supreme Master Ching Hai. And I think, uh, whatever they do, like it shows through. You know, they are taught about uh, justice, respect, compassion, and love for the planet, for the environment, and it shows through because they, they are active and they help us in our cubes a lot of times. Right. So they join you, um, so you're doing this twice a month. Which days of the week are you doing them in Bali? Always Sunday. Always on a Sunday. Yes, and where do you do it? In the morning, 7 to 10 a.m. Where in? Uh in in Denpasar. Okay. So yeah. like there's a thing called uh, Car Free Sunday in many major cities in Indonesia. It's like, it's mandatory. They have to, uh, they have this, uh, like a window of time when cars are not allowed. So people can do, can go jogging, they can go cycling, they can do sports, they, there are events. And in Bali, it's in Denpasar every Sunday morning okay. from 7 to 10 a.m. Yeah. So uh, all the roads around this park are closed. So there's heavy foot traffic, you know, like hundreds of people will pass through. And what kind of reaction do you get from your Cubes of Truth with, uh, with the, the local people in, in Bali, for example? Yeah. Different reactions, obviously. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, very uh, diverse. Uh, they're mostly open to the idea. Because living in, the, in a tropical country, they're used to plant-based foods anyway. So, um, uh, they already eat mostly plants anyway, right? Like, yeah. Uh, we have fruits all year round, different kinds of fruits, tropical fruits. And then um, uh, tempeh and tofu are staples, basically. You know, they eat rice and beans. So, uh, the idea is not foreign to them, you know. Like, and uh, uh, they also have... Um, they have experiences with friends and families who, um, yeah. who suffer from like um, animal co animal related diseases like um, heart disease, you know, like cancer. So uh, there's that uh, fear factor as well, you know, that they want to be healthy. Uh, however, one of the challenges I found is that they are very attached to traditions and cultures and uh, religion, unfortunately, and. Uh, Whereas uh, they can see, they can see uh, a lifestyle change. They, they can imagine themselves changing their lifestyle. They, it, it's harder for them to imagine. Um, it's hard. It's hard for them to imagine um, to stop taking part in, uh, like, the traditions. Like, like yeah, because Indonesia is is a Muslim country. A Muslim country. Yeah. Uh, however, the, Bali is a Hindu island. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. However, they also have a culture of sacrificing animals. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that that's a that's an obstacle. Uh, it's hard for them to see. Uh, it's hard for them to imagine, uh, like not taking part in the animal sacrifice because th they think that they have to do it. They they believe that they might believe that they might be ostracized from the culture if they if they, if they don't take part right. in it if they refuse it if they reject it. Yeah. So, however, in the rest of Indonesia, that's true. You know, like. Um, there's also the religion part. I think it doesn't matter which religion; m many people will use it as as an excuse. You know, like even non-religious people use that use religion as an excuse not to be vegan. I mean, yeah. Especially in Europe, they there do, are so yeah. many people that, that don't practice religion, and yet they'll still use the argument of God or Christianity to to continue their habits of eating animals, which doesn't really make sense. No, at not all. at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because Bali is considered literally vegan heaven for so many people, and people yes. travel from all over the world because there's so many vegan restaurants here, vegan options. Why do you think Bali is considered vegan heaven? Uh, first of all, it's true. Uh, I agree. It's very easy. I think even in Indonesia, Bali is the easiest place to to be vegan when you eat out. Yeah. Um, although, as we both know, being vegan is easy anywhere, anyway. Yeah. If nowadays, there's the no victims. excuse. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No. Even. Anytime, if we focus on the victims, True. you know, it's easier for us, yeah. you know, and it's a moral obligation anyway. Yeah, like any time of in history. And uh, why is it easy? I think uh, part of the reason is that because it's a hub, there are influences from from outside. There's so much Western influence, so um, there's that awareness, you know, about veganism. So I think like 
um, tourists and foreigners, they come here and they bring that awareness. And then they start vegan restaurants, you know, and, and because there are a lot of tourists, uh, there's demand for vegan food as well. So they have to cater to that. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, so you think that growth in veganism in Bali came from the outside rather than from within? Uh, both. Yeah. But helped by uh, outside influences, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. Because, um, yeah, most of the vegan restaurants... Oh, not quite, actually. Um, for example, restaurants in Changgu and Ubud are mostly owned by, like, uh, foreigners or partly owned by foreigners. Or, whereas uh, in Denpasar, um, there's so many like locally owned vegan restaurants. But the thing is with locally owned vegan restaurants, um, most of them are motivated by uh, religion or tradition. Um, as long as the, the, goal, the end goal is vegan, then that's, that's a good thing yeah. in my view here. Yeah. But yeah, I believe like we should be able to come to this conclusion through logic and reason ultimately you know. yeah of course I mean we use food to try and seduce people into the idea you know exactly. like oh look yeah. how amazing this Buddha bowl looks but ultimately that's not the main reason no. yeah. why we do it it's not exactly. because of the food it's because of the animals it's exactly. for the animal liberation that's for mainly yeah. for justice yeah. and so obviously the animal rights movement has grown a lot in the past few years mm -hmm. where do you see it going in the future I think it's only going to get more and more radical we need I think we need uh, radicality. Um, um, of course, like we want, um, we want to have understanding. We want to uh, educate people, and we need more and more conversations. You know, like I believe, like the word vegan will become more and more acceptable. But you say we need radical, like to be radical. What do you mean by that? Oh right, um, meaning um, as you know about uh, other forms of activism, like like meet the victims. Yeah. You know, like, we will definitely uh, expose the industry, you know, and we will um, will disrupt the norm. We'll disrupt the the status quo. There will be more and more of that uh, actions, like direct action everywhere, so, you know, and uh, yeah, going into slaughterhouses and farms mm. to document what's been going on. Basically, um, yeah, it's just we have the the tools already. We have the internet. It's time that people know the truth. I believe. So I think. Uh, yeah, there will be a balance. Whereas, like, I've chosen the path of like education, but I'll fully support direct action. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do you think there are any forms of at activism that are better than others, or do you think that everything kind of contributes towards? Everything contributes towards the the end goal. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's one activism that's better or worse than another yeah. because it speaks to different people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think as long as it's uh, non-violent and it sends a clear vegan message, then by all means, uh, do it. Yeah. yeah. By a clear vegan message, I mean uh, animal liberation. It's a message of equality. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that you chose the path of um, education. So or people not, yeah. can do it through all different ways. People yeah. do it through communication. People, some people do it through food. And mm -hmm. you choose education. So how do you educate people about veganism, for example? One of them is uh, through street activism. Of course, we educate uh, passers-by. But also... Um, uh, with with the local vegan organization, there's a lo organization called Indonesian Vegan Society. We organize bazaars. We also host talks. You know, like recently we invited Dr. Will Tuttle. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, he's a great like, vegan inspiration of mine since my early vegan days. Uh, his book World Peace Diet like completely changed my worldview. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, something like that. And we do talks by doctors and nutritionists. And you manage to reach a big non-vegan crowd with the yes. with these talks because that's Usually the important thing, talks. isn't it? You, exactly, know, you want yeah. non-vegans to come. If yeah. only vegans show up to these events, it's kind of not not that impactful. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I think about it, yeah, vegans are still a minority. People who who even um, people who claim to be vegans are already a minority. But I think people who who are real vegans, meaning people who understand speciesism, are e even a tinier minority. So I think. Education is will never be enough. We should still educate even fellow vegans. You know, so, but you, you're quite right. Like most of uh, the attendees in these talks are mostly non-vegans. That's and great. Yeah, yeah, they're just interested in plant-based living. You know, mm -hmm. or they want to be healthier. You know, and then they get exposed to to the message. You know, that it is possible to live without 
contributing to the meat, dairy and egg industry. Yeah. I mean, we always look at it from the perspective that it's possible to survive, it's possible to live, but ultimately you thrive on... Absolutely. Be that just from the start of a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And then when you even start thinking about the ethics of it, you start thinking about breaking those habits of pain and cruelty and suffering that we've been doing for so many generations now. That's like when you said earlier, it just becomes so easy when you focus on the victims, on those that are suffering mm -hmm. from our choices. So... Would you say it was hard for you to go vegan or was it the moment you kind of had the knowledge you could do it straight away? I did it straight away. Really? So One yeah, day it's the next yeah. starts, yeah. Because I was already open to the idea. Yeah. Um, my main roadblock was um, the uh, nutrition. I was simply ignorant about the nutrition and I was, uh, I was fooled by, by, by society, by probably the media because I thought um, to be vegan, I would need to really watch my nutrition, you know, really like count my calories, you know, count my macros to make sure I had all the right nutrients. Uh, but it turned out I didn't have to do that. Yeah. You know, as long as you eat uh, a wide variety of you know, plant-based food, uh, you should be fine, you know. Yeah, I don't really count calories or plan my meals. I'm very right, uh, yeah. uh, very unhealthy when it comes to these things. I just eat, like as long as no one died, I'm happy yeah. to have it. You know, that's pretty much yeah. uh, how it goes for me. Yeah. With that said, like it is still important to to know how to thrive on a plant-based diet though because uh, yeah, we want to dispel the myth, right? Like, yeah, that, that I mean, that's always yeah. what terrifies me when um, you know, famous people go vegan, for example. Like, okay, first of all, great, you know, that can have a huge influence on yep. other people. But then second of all, it terrifies me because what if in a month they do it wrong, for example, and they go back to eating animals again and then they're going to put out a message that, well, it's, it's not good. Like, a uh, plant-based diet is not good. Veganism doesn't make sense. Absolutely. And then I can have a huge negative impact as well. So it is important that if you choose to do it, and especially if you're a public figure, then do it right, you know? I mean, Absolutely, give it yeah. a fair chance. That's a problem with, like, people with big, huge influence, right? Like, yeah. They can lead their followers in different directions. Yeah. With that said, that's why it's also important for us to uh, make it clear what veganism is. Like, it's not a diet, you know, like, and uh, to be honest, uh, ultimately, you know, because um, it is possible, it's, it is still possible to be sick on a vegan diet, you know, while being vegan. Yeah. So um, I think people who have problems, who have difficulties while being vegan, I think we need, we really need to help them, you know, like honestly, that ultimately it's not that, uh, that's why like in, in my advocacy, I try to avoid like making generalized claims as well that veganism is healthier, because it's not necessarily, yeah. you know, we, um, if you eat right, maybe, like, uh, some people may have problems, you know, like, when, when going vegan, maybe they're not used to it. Th but the idea is that we all should strive for vegan solutions, you know. We, we shouldn't uh, exploit or use others to benefit us, you know. That the idea is if we come together, if we all work together, we can... And we will find a vegan solution for our problems. And I think that's the, the idea that we should uh, move towards. You know. I think what's important as well is that we, we manage to unify as well the, the movement. Because I do, it does seem like there's a lot of different offshoots. You know, you've got lots of different groups. You've got lots of different activists. Lots of, some activists don't like other activists, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. So you being in Bali, which is, like you said, a place where lots of people unite and they come here and lots of people meet up. How do you think we can help each other work together to achieve our end goal? I think differences are natural. I think it's okay to acknowledge our differences. And, but ultimately, um, I think we need to remind each other of our, of our goal, of our yeah. mutual um, wish, mutual goal, which is animal liberation. Yeah, wherever we can, we should uh, like, like set our differences aside, set our ego aside, and help each other whenever we can. Yeah. Like, um, there are so many of these um, organizations, right? The Safe Movement, uh, Anonymous for the Voiceless. In many cases, I've seen that the people, um, the, the activists, um, like, help each other, you know? Like, um, they intersect a lot. I think we should, like, get rid of this idea of competition because um, everyone's just different, you know? Like, uh, we, have, we all have our own styles of advocacy. Yeah, like, just get rid of this idea. I mean, if you always maintain the idea of why you're doing it for the right reasons, if yep. it's not for personal gain, then it's easy, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. you have no issues in, I don't know, prom they say promoting because it's, the, it's not promoting because it's not a business, but putting other people forward and showing, like, this person put out a great video, this is great advocacy, and just supporting each other genuinely. I think we need a lot of that 
to make this happen because we are still like you say a huge minority absolutely yes, yeah and yes. there's still i mean i see it a lot on social media especially a lot of activists um, actually taking each other down and criticizing each other's uh, forms of outreach or this kind of stuff and yeah absolutely first of all like support each other yeah we can absolutely promote each other and uh, to be fair like uh, constructive criticism is necessary yeah just like we all became vegan everyone is capable of changing even if you disagree with someone like yeah the a good idea is to um, talk to them straight and offer constructive criticism instead of tearing each other down you yeah know? that's absolutely important yeah through instagram stories and uh, stuff like that you know uh, oh do you see that happen yeah, a lot you see, nowadays you see yeah? It happen yeah. every now and again and yeah. so for example is your family vegan uh, my dad is <laughs> oh wow yeah, yeah. Because I found a lot of activists like they really struggle to get through to their families about the vegan message. Yes. They have such a huge impact around the world through social media, through friends, mm -hmm. street activism, etc. But then when it comes to home, they they struggle to get that message through. So, how how do you talk and deal with your non-vegan family members, family. for example? That's very true. That's a good question. Um, with families, um, I learned a lot from my friends' families, from other families. It's true that it is somehow for whatever reason, uh, more difficult to reach through to family. But with but it's possible, absolutely. I've seen families uh, turn vegan because of um, influences from their family members. And uh, there's, I call it the long game. With families, um, some people might have to use like a softer approach. They just have to show, uh, to be an example, to show how easy it is, how delicious it is to be, to be vegan. Uh, how you can still eat delicious foods, how you can still thrive and like, you know, go out and like do things and exercise while being vegan. Um, and uh, sometimes it, it, it works better if the message comes from someone else. So with family, it's a good idea to show them documentaries or uh, lead them to YouTube videos you know, so that they can absorb it themselves. Yeah, but as ultimately it depends on how, what your relationship yeah. like is your family. I'm quite lucky that... Um, my dad is very open-minded. Like he considers me an equal. Who was vegan first, you or him? A about the same time. Okay. So well. I think he was inspired because I was a vegetarian, but back then I don't consider myself a as an ethical person back then, you know, because you know I was still a vegetarian. But yeah. Um, but that was what you knew at the time. That was, that the, was what with I the knew, best absolutely. knowledge that you had at that time. Yeah. You thought you were doing the right thing. So. Exactly. Well, quite right too. Yeah. But uh, it was enough to inspire him. Yeah. But he just um, came across the right person. He met. He became friends with a vegan nutritionist who's uh, president of the Indonesian Vegan Society. And he also made the World Vegan Organization, which okay. is a worldwide organization. And uh, now they both uh, travel together sometimes to promote veganism. Wow. The nutritionist from the nutri nutrition aspect and my dad from the uh, from a parenting aspect. And, uh, so he talks about how to raise children yeah. vegan and that kind of stuff? Yeah, just raising children with love, but yeah, he puts in veganism. Ah, right. okay. Yeah. That's his uh, job anyway. Ah, right, okay. He's so it's a more parenting aspect. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Child psychologist. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm quite lucky yeah. in that regard. Um, and uh, to, even though like he first went vegan for help, I'm quite lucky that uh, he still listens to me. You know, so I still like lecture him on the ethical aspect of veganism. You know about clothing, you know, mm. all, about all other aspects of veganism, animal testing, um, transportation, you know, uh, entertainment. So with families, yeah, it is absolutely possible to, to influence them. However, just like with any activism, right, uh, it takes two to tango. It's a two-way street. Yeah, so it course, depends yeah. on how receptive they are. I mean, it's hard like with family because we have expectations, but try to get rid of expectations you know and you might just yeah. be surprised you know just with any activism yeah. but even if you look age wise it's mainly our generation so like we said they were both the same age right yeah. of 28 um like the millennial age group mm -hmm. it seems to be in within that age group that there's the biggest shift towards veganism especially Absolutely. in i see it especially in the uk do you see there's a, a huge growth in the vegan movement in our age group here as well Absolutely. I think yeah. it's uh, mostly uh, connected to the social media, you know, and how widespread it is, how we can uh, spread an idea like wildfire, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, most people nowadays have gadgets, you know, they're, they're on social media, so they can be exposed 
to this information very easily. Yeah, the reach you can have is incredible with it. Absolutely. I mean, that's why it's, yeah, yeah, it's very important. That's I mean, that's how we met, you know, through yeah. the social media. I mean, I was in Dubai, you were here. Exactly. A message through a phone, and all of a sudden, here we are, sitting in front of three cameras and Making these very... The best use of your time, yeah. In very comfortable chairs, you know, <laughs> swinging around. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> social media. Um, yeah, uh, strangely, in my, in my experience, though, in, in the UK, it's way more diverse than that. Probably because I do, uh, like, direct activism, you know, like... The, at least in London, yeah, the, the activist community is very diverse in terms of age and like yeah. background. And yeah, that's my experience. Like, m- maybe it's different everywhere. But, and because of social media, I'm lucky, we are lucky enough to be able to meet you know, people of all backgrounds. You know, like, we live in faraway places. You, know, like you live in Dubai and I live here in Bali. Yeah, this would never have happened, say, what, 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what's amazing and that's how veganism is growing as well. As genuinely through social media because you like you said you can spread that message you can reach so many people in such mm-hmm. a short amount of time and then you can connect and you can learn about other things you can question the status quo of what you've always been taught and what you've always been told you know Absolutely, like yeah. this is tradition this is the way it is i was talking about um christmas and someone was saying yeah but i couldn't have a christmas dinner without uh, turkey or without sausages and I was like, well, you can still have Christmas dinner without those things. Like, I understand, like, you always have had that. That's part of tradition. You're used to it. But that's just a habit. We can break habits quite easily. Obviously, you're from Indonesia. You said not, I mean, from Jakarta, not from Bali. Mm-hmm. What are the traditions that people find hardest to, uh, to break away from? Because you mentioned sacrifice earlier. That's in Bali. That's, that's in Bali correct, through yeah, the it's Hindu. It's hard for them to yeah. let go of the sacrifice. Um, even recently at the talk by Dr. Will Tuttle, there was one Balinese who asked a question, uh, because Will Tuttle talked about spirituality as well, uh, this woman asked a question about uh, an animal sacrifice, because um, they think spirituality in Bali um, depends on animal sacrifice, they think it pleases their gods. Right. Yeah, so that's one of the obstacles here. Um, however, Will Tattle gave a brilliant answer as well. Like, what did he say about that? He said that cultures can change. and uh, We're all part of a culture, we're all part of a tradition, and we have evolved a lot from, you know, from our ancestors. We don't do what they do anymore. And he gave an example, like, even in India, when, uh, where they used to, um, some of them still uh, use milk as offering, but in some uh, villages, they've switched that to water. It's not that they stopped their tradition or they've simply shifted their understanding yeah. because if they want to please their sort of deity, why would their deity want a product that caused suffering, a product of exploitation? You know, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, that's also a question that I, I always ask when it does come to religion and people use religion as justification for mm-hmm. eating meat is why would the God want the animals to suffer if you're going to eat them, you know? And why would you make it to a product that genuinely kills you as well? So Absolutely. It doesn't, yeah. I mean, obviously I'm not questioning the religious aspect there, but just it doesn't seem to quite make sense mm-hmm. to put that into tradition. However, I wouldn't mind the questioning the religious aspect as well. Yeah. Whereas um, I'm still torn. I don't know what the best way is to to reach religious people, you know. In some cases, um, we want to offer them like a different um, understanding. For example, in Christianity, there's the idea of dominion, um, dominion over other animals. Some people may um, offer the idea that dominion doesn't have to mean um, dominating or like doing whatever you want to the other animals. It can mean taking care of those animals. On the other hand, um, I also value honesty and I think that religion is unnecessary at best. And so whatever good that religion can offer, uh, we can have it without it. You know, like, even if religion can um, uh, motivate someone to be more compassionate, to be kind, we can have that without that particular re- religion. You know, like, we can have that through logic and reason mm. alone. So, yeah, compassion yeah. doesn't have to come from a religious aspect, does Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. You don't have to be religious to be a good person. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you say you're not afraid to get into the religious aspect of, of it. What do you mean by that? I mean, just questioning religion and how unnecessary it is. You know, in fact, I'll be honest, I think overall, 
religion is more harmful than good because and I mean all religions here because um, they all like teach that humans are somehow at the top of creation that somehow we um, we have dominion over other animals or that we are allowed to uh, do whatever we want to other animals to subjugate to dominate to exploit you know? because even like the religions that you think are somehow more peaceful like Hindu Buddha um, there are people using them to justify let's say uh, in Hindu yeah I mean I think all all theory. religions if you look at the text spread a message of peace but then it's how people you take that for yeah. personal gain. Mm -hmm. I think there's there are a lot of people that do abuse it 100 percent, and then they take it to a whole different level. Absolutely. Were you raised in a religious family or? Um, somehow, somewhat, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Well, I was raised to to think that I was a certain religion, yeah. you know, like, and then I decided I wanted to be another religion until I decided. Were you that raised Muslim or? Yes, Muslim. Okay, yeah, I was in. But then I decided to become Christian and w went to church, and then I, and then I realized you don't need any of this you know you can yeah. live ethically you can live in harmony with you know your surrounding without religion at all yeah, yeah. it's funny because i mean obviously i was raised i wouldn't say i was raised atheist but i was raised completely without religion mm -hmm. so it wasn't there's no god or it wasn't you yeah. know there is a god or it was just like do whatever you want there's no sense of judgment so i was kind of raised obviously not as a religious person yeah. and and i think it's kind of with everything the way you're raised has a massive impact on the way you act and the way you go through society. And then obviously the same way I was raised to eat meat, to eat cheese, and to find it normal to wear a leather jacket, for example, mm -hmm. or to watch, I don't know, horse racing on TV and to think that's normal. Yeah. And obviously now I start to question all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also like even looking at, well, I wasn't raised religious, but then how can I put a moral judgment onto religion without having looked into it or studied it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm really trying to like take a step back from everything and question like everything. I'm not saying any of the religions are good, any of the religions are bad, but I'm really trying to like take a critical opinion on everything. Because I think even in most religions, it does say question your faith as well. So I think it's, it's fair enough to take a, everything from a critical standpoint as well. Absolutely, yeah. I think the Buddha said that. In, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. But even that, some people call that a religion, some people call it a lifestyle. Or it's philosophy. A, it's yeah. philosophy, yeah. yeah. So I think it really doesn't matter what you call it. I mean, it's just to be the best person that you can be. And you don't, obviously, you can't justify any of that through religion. It's just exactly. follow human nature as we are inherently kind as children, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Like, I think in that same speech you were talking about earlier from Gary Rofsky, and he talks about um, putting a baby in a crib with an apple and a, and a right. rabbit. Yeah. How we're, you're kind as a child. It's learned behaviors that come yeah. later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably right. Like, we are somehow more um, inclined towards empathy. You know, yeah. I think society uh, drove that away from us, like slowly. Yeah, because we don't see what goes on, do we? We don't. We don't witness. You know, you yeah. go to a supermarket or you just buy something and it's already there, pre-cut, yeah. pre-packaged, and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes we are shown. That this is the dangerous thing. Uh, some children are shown the reality, but. Society tells them that it's okay. So some, sometimes uh, violence is normalized from a young age. For example, in Indonesia and many other countries where uh, Islam is practiced, they, uh, they practice um, animal sacrifice every year. And uh, it happens in the open and children watch what's yeah, happening. Yeah, in the streets, yeah. yeah. So this is one of the dangers of religion, you know. But they try to justify it as you know, as a mandate of their religion, you know. And so uh, they are taught from a young age, uh, even though they see this as horrible, they are taught that it's okay, this is normal, you know, this is for God, you know. So this is one of the ways that violence can be normalized, you know. So um, it's absolutely important to show the truth, right, to show people the full scope of what's happening. But um, the narrative that we tell them is also is equally as important, yeah. you know, if not more important, you know, the narrative that we tell them, you know, like, so in that regard, like, when children are shown what's happening, but being told that it's okay, they're not showing the, uh, they're not being completely honest, right? Nobody ever told children that we actually don't need to kill animals, you know, our body has no need for animal protein, you know, 
and uh, once we reach adulthood, we don't need milk anymore. The, the only milk you need is from your mother. You know, nobody's ever been told that. You know, like yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't need the uh, ovulation from chickens. You know, to be healthy. Yeah, I mean, I think back to some of the meals that I was eating before I became vegan, and it makes me cringe. You know, yeah. and I thought I was healthy. Mm -hmm. I would go to the gym, like, and I would eat, come back from the gym, and have like four boiled eggs and a can of tuna and I would think that would actually be good for me when I was basically kidding myself more than anything else even like the misconceptions that we have about nutrition mm -hmm. that are kind of just handed down through what we hear and what people tell us if you think about it, in school you have no education when it comes to nutrition no you're quite right yeah it's not even taught in biology I think no yeah. all you learn is a bunch of I mean there's a lot of good stuff. It's good to learn how to Absolutely. count, how to read. Yeah. It's good to go to school. But then if we focused on real life skills that people could actually implement in their day-to-day -day lives, then maybe people wouldn't grow up to be so lost and confused about what's going on. You know? Absolutely, yeah. This is why I think education is important. Like In many countries around the world, there needs to be a massive hall of the curriculum. You know, like We need to like drastically change the curriculum because... Yeah, there's a lot of inf misinformation as well, you know, and it's dangerous, you know, to yeah. to perpetuate that. However, uh, massive change has happened. For example, in Indonesia, uh, they've changed the food pyramid with a it's like a circle instead, and then they divide the circle, you know, and it's uh, uh, and milk is already uh, uh, they get they got rid of milk as a food group, you know, they got rid of dairy. I think the same happened in Canada as well, you know. So it's no longer on the food. It's no longer on the on the food uh, recommendation. Dr. Susianto, which is uh, who is a leader of the Indonesian Vegan Society, like uh, he uh, he does lectures all over Indonesia, like spreading uh, this information, you know. And uh, he works with the uh, Department of Health as well to to spread this message, you know. In Indonesia, at least, like babies have the right to to drink their mother's breast milk. You know, instead of being given like, yeah. cow's milk formula, the the importance of breast yeah, milk. Yeah, I mean, there was a massive time in the in Europe where formula was considered better than than breast milk. Yeah. Which, if you think, can't really make sense. I mean, no, the yeah. breast milk else's. is made yeah. for that child. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like cow's milk is someone else's milk, you know, like, and from a different species who are biologically different from us, you know, like. And you're taking that milk away from another baby. Exactly. That's the most important part. the yeah. Exploitative yeah. aspect. As we were talking about education, and it was, I think it was 2nd of July, Bali banned all straws. Single use plastic. Single use yeah. plastics. Including straws. Uh, plastic bags, plastic bottles. And obviously that's great, you know, because um, it's an island. They don't have a lot of places to kind of put that to waste. And I was reading that only 8% of it is actually uh, recycled. recycled. But that's the same in Europe and in the US as well. I mean, we can't point fingers at, we're still very bad at recycling all that stuff. Yeah, the ban on single-use plastic. I think that's a massive step, yeah. you know, like massive progress. And um, I think it uh, shows the awareness level of our society at the moment. It's always increasing, right? People are becoming more aware of how harmful it is to the environment. Yeah. And I think it's super important that we do focus as well on the environmental aspect because that yep. draws more people into veganism yes, and then into both. the animal aspect and then into animal rights as yeah, well. Yeah. Because I do think those are very much connected and I got into veganism largely through the environmental aspect of of the impact that it does have. Yeah. And then obviously once I saw the animal aspect then yeah. I took a whole new level to it. So if we can really sensitize people to w what's happening to our planet and how desperate it is that we make some change. Absolutely. Then yeah. we can get a lot more people involved in our movement. Yeah. And I see, uh, I think in the envir environmental movement, there's more... Uh, there's a bigger sense of urgency, you know. People are compelled to do action more, um, as seen by uh, the rise of actions like uh, Trash Hero. They do yeah. cleanups, you know, beach cleanups. Somehow there's, uh, yeah, an urgency for action. Um, however, I believe it's also important to uh, always drive home the ethical message, because it's it's fundamental, right? Ethics, you know, justice for is fundamental, and I think we can use any topic. And bring it there to the to the ethics, you know, yeah. like uh, like ban on single use plastic, massive step, right? Massive progress, but we can also ask like, why do we do it in the first place? You know, what's the purpose? Whenever we want to take an action, um, let's ask like, 
uh, why? You know, like, what's the underlying motivation behind it? You know, uh, one example I would like to point out is uh, how people would stop using plastic to save the fish, but they won't stop eating the fish to save the fish. Yeah, now, that's a massive like hypocrisy. You know? Yeah, it, it's an, always an interesting argument to bring up, and mm. I think everyone loves the ocean. Yes, everyone loves going to the beach. Not, I mean, not everyone. Some people don't like having sand between their toes or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's always some people. But people want to preserve it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like to preserve our planet. And then you look at more or less 50% of the plastic in our oceans is coming from the fishing industry. Absolutely. Fishing nets, yeah. And then obviously the bycatch, all the fish that are killed in the process, mm -hmm. dolphins, whales, turtles, yeah. huge victims of the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can connect the two raise the awareness about, okay, that's great, you've taken that step to ban plastic, and now what we need to do is stop supporting a fish industry that's destroying Absolutely. our oceans. So yeah. I do think that we connecting the two movements is a great way to go, obviously Absolutely. keeping that clear vegan message and yeah. not diluting it or compromising exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. But it's always tough, you know, because you wanna, I want I want the all movements to unite, you know, whatever yeah. cause yeah. people are fighting for, I want people to work together. Mm -hmm. And I think every cause... Is, has its value as well Absolutely. and I support every social cause that people are fighting for I always say we're not necessarily fighting the same battle but we're fighting the same war for systemic change mm -hmm. and that's what we do want Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a balancing act right? Like, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, however I just I would like to imagine you know, what if um, we speak up for all these different um, topics different issues but we all keep a keep a clear vegan message at heart, you know, like how much faster um, we would reach animal liberation if that were the case, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it only makes sense if you are an environmentalist for you to, to be vegan as well. Absolutely. Because okay. if you're protecting the environment, who are you protecting? You're protecting exactly. the inhabitants of that, yes. yeah. the animals. So yeah. it doesn't make sense for you to support exploitation on one side yeah. and conservation on the other. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that being said, like when I say uh, some people in the movement are hypocrites, it's not to like tear them down or bring them down, but sometimes uh, realizing that you know our own hypocrisy, it can be a great motivator for change. You know, like yeah. many people, like my friend Ed, Earthling Ed, like he became vegan because he realized he was being a hypocrite. You know, like he was feeling sorry for uh, chickens who died in a truck crash. However, he had dead chicken bodies in his fridge. You know, like yeah. that feeling of hypocrisy. So uh, many people are ge uh, are genuinely ignorant, and we can understand that, and we need to educate them. Um, however, we need to yeah, to stop like uh, beating around the bushes and like call it what it is. You know, if you care about the planet, if you care about anything at all, if you care about justice, if you care about um, equality, you know, then it only makes sense for all of us to be vegan. You know, like hey, imagine that. You know, like all activists come together. You know, all activists in any battle. You know, like any issues, like the uh, the feminist, the um, um, environmentalist you know like we all um, spread veganism you know in in our fight you know and how much faster it would spread but then if I always try and look at it from other people's perspectives oh, you yeah. know? so if I look at it from an environmentalist perspective I'm sure they look at a lot of vegans including myself and like well you're a hypocrite because you're a vegan like obviously you want like, animal liberation and you want to protect the environment yep. but you I don't know for example I'm sure I'm not the most environmentally friendly like oh, I'm sure it. like I haven't managed to change all my clothes to ethical okay. clothes. You know, I still yeah. have clothes. And like I still fly. You know, from the, yeah, yeah. I know. And I can understand why they flip the argument on its head it as well be, yeah. from, from their perspective because they obviously focus entirely on that environmental yeah. aspect. Quite right. Too. Yeah. I think uh, just like how we became vegan, we uh, questioned ourselves. I think um, the important aspect of this movement is attitude. What kind of attitude should we have? I think it's important for all of us, you know. I think the attitude we should have is, how can we make a positive change, you know? So instead of like rejecting and like uh, shutting down conversations, we sh we should be open to hearing it, you know. Yeah. And, and I am open to hearing more about what more I can do, you know. However, it's also important to note um, um, the two different cases here yeah, between like veganism and um, other environmental endeavors. Um, with environmental endeavors. I mean, we can always do more, right? So it's like a spectrum, you know, like um, there's no like clear cutting off point, you know, like um, like how should we live, you know, like how 
how low our carbon footprint should be, you know, it's not quite clear. It's debatable, and we can always all do as low more. as possible. I think yeah, yeah, as much as possible yeah. and practicable. However, with veganism, um, the the clear cutting off point is exploitation. With with um, at least with like meat, dairy, and eggs, whenever we purchase these uh, products, there's always a victim at the end of the line. When we buy meat, there's always someone who lost their lives. When we buy eggs, there's always a hen whose reproductive system was exploited, you know, and not to mention the male chicks who are discarded, either ground up alive or choked up in a in a plastic bag. And whenever we buy milk, there's a calf somewhere who doesn't get his, you know, and there's a grieving mother somewhere. So yeah. it's a lot clearer, I think. Like, so at least at at least with veganism, I think it's something that we. Uh, all rational, logical people can agree about, you know, like with meat, dairy, eggs, we don't need it. With leather, you know, we don't need it. Absolutely not, you know. However, yeah. As, yeah, as I think that makes sense what you're saying is because obviously you can reduce as much as possible your mm-hmm. carbon footprint, you can reduce as much as possible your intake of, of stuff for your health. Yep. Um, but then, like you say, when it comes to exploitation, you can't there's no amount of explo- animal exploitation that is acceptable that's acceptable yeah. or justifiable exactly and so once you bring in that argument it goes straight down to zero because yes. obviously there's, at the moment beyond veganism and the rise in vegan options the rise in vegan restaurants it, it does honestly mainly come down to people who are reducing and who are curious about veganism it's not actual vegans because there's not enough of us quite right yes um, I was listening to it was Seb Alex on the Plant Proof podcast and he was talking about how most in most vegan restaurants, they run off non-vegans because they're the one, there's not enough vegans to make a vegan yeah, restaurant right. survive. Exactly. Yeah. So, even though that's where the growth is, we still need to focus on the fact that of getting that clear message through to make Absolutely, a lot more people yes. make that decision to go fully vegan and then become active. active. On top of that, do you remember like that first event where you went to the first Cube of Truth that you went to? The first Cube of Truth was in. London, actually. How was in it? In Leicester Square. Leicester Square? Leicester Square, yeah. How was your first conversation? Conversation. Um, I actually practiced first from, um, it wasn't Keep of Truth, the first bit, um, active semi I went to was Earthlings Experience, the predecessor to Keep of Truth. Right? Okay. And uh, I was nervous at the beginning, but thankfully I was around uh, brilliant people. So I was, I was quite nervous and uh, I think I blanked out at one point. Someone asked like, so as a vegan, what do you eat? You know, like, and then, like, I just blanked out. Like, like, I'm sure I ate something, but yeah. like, just blanked <laughs> out. But thankfully, I had, like, a friend of mine like, who was, uh, I think she was eight years old at the time, you know, like, oh, this girl is vegan. What do you eat? You know, like, and then she just listed, like, all yeah. the food. But um, how was it at the time? Uh, I was such a uh, an enthusiastic, like, I was a new activist. I still had hope. Well, I still do have hope. I was, we always need to have optimism. But, uh, um, yeah, but, like... N- I felt like like nothing could stop me, you know. Yeah. Like, like, and uh, I still believe that, like, with activism, it's just a matter of like spreading your seeds as far and wide as possible. Because eventually, there's always someone who's interested, you know. Even if you uh, come across a roadblock, if you, if you, if you talk to someone who just comes up with excuses, you know, who's hard to reach through, at least you planted your seed and just move on to the next one, you know. Like, there's always someone who. Who, who will appreciate the information that you yeah. share. You know? So would you focus more on people who are already interested? Or would you focus on those people who are like literally shut down shut to down. it, like the trolls kind of thing? The trolls. Uh, I still give them equal amount of time. And yeah? Because, yeah, um, because I've been surprised so many times, you know, like by how um, how they can turn around 180 degrees. It depends on like... Um, which uh, which information you share with them because people connect with different things. Some people are more concerned with health. Mm. Some people are more concerned with the environment. You know, like so. I just try to, you know, uh, share all the information available. Yeah. I mean, I often say people are like keypads. Like what? keypads. Yeah. So everyone has a code. You just got to hit the digits in the right order. Right. So you can always get through to people just as long as you're doing it in the right, in the right order. Way, yeah. You know, because some people, you can get them to become literally animal rights activists through horse riding or through I don't know cosmetics through the beauty industry through animal testing you know things that 
obviously uh, I wasn't that sensitive to because I don't actually use many like beauty products. I wasn't aware of it. Same, yeah. Yeah, I, I, for me it was more about like food. You know, that was what I saw and that's what I knew exactly, about. Like yeah. I hadn't thought about horse racing. For me, that hadn't really crossed my mind until even a few years ago. Exactly. So yeah. it's crazy how people can come from all around that spectrum. And I think the most important thing is to listen to them. Listen, yes. Yeah, and see what what ticks with them and what what seems to be a focal point for them. Yes, that's a skill I've learned um, throughout uh, these two years of doing activism as well. Listening, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes, it's, yeah. Nowadays, I listen more than I speak because um, so that yeah, you can tailor make your answer, you know, to. Uh, what resonates with them, with who you're speaking to. I wish you that first time you do street activism, you think, okay, I'm going to make everyone go vegan <laughs> on the spot. You know? <laughs> and then you realize that's really not no, how it goes no. at all, is it? You know, yeah. No. yeah, I already didn't have that much expectation, you know, like, yeah. but uh, because I've dealt with, um, uh, with difficult people, like, in my life as well. So, like, but, um, but sometimes, you know, it can give you a great, a great boost of uh, positivity, of motivation when someone, when it clicks for someone on the spot, when they see the footage and you talk to them and it clicks for them that they need to change their life there and then. Sometimes, uh, yeah, it can be beautiful, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's true you see, obviously, a, a huge amount and a growing amount of street activism, chapters opening everywhere. And I do think it's great to, to be on the streets and talking mm -hmm. to individuals. But... How realistically do you think we can make a vegan world? Depends on the day, like <laughs> my optimism fades. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that like, feeling. Yeah, yeah. Because I, world, I don't yeah. know, like through obviously Shrek, I think it is great. You do get out a very powerful message, and mm -hmm. you talk to a lot of people, and individually you can have a big impact. And then yep. obviously a lot of people record those conversations, and then they put them on social media, and then right. that can impact more people, oh, etc. Yeah. But ultimately. Does that really create a change in the system? Absolutely. Ah, you're talking about that. System. Yeah. System change. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's that kind of. Do you focus on the individuals or do you focus on the system on, change, on yeah. the system? For now, uh, I believe both actions are necessary. Yeah. We need system change. We need individual change. I think you can't have one without the other, right? Like they both, because the system is made up of individuals. Any initiative to change the system. Um, is a positive, you know, like it's, yeah. it's necessary. Um, and ultimately, if you think about it, these, let's say the state or the governments, mm -hmm. they're not going to change something if there's no demand for it, are they really? So technically, you do need individuals yeah, to switch leading the towards well. that, you know, yes, to create exactly. that demand for the systemic change as well. Absolutely, yes. But I think, yeah, with the rise of veganism, eventually we will have people who make the connection in, in the government as well, you know, like in... And so... Um, yeah, I think somehow it is important to influence uh, people in power as well. Yeah, I mean everyone. Is really, there a vegan yeah. president in the world or a vegan prime minister? Not that I know. No. Of, yeah, that'd but be amazing. That's the, yeah, that's a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen any fully ethical vegan politician yeah. so far, except for like uh, parties, but like for animals, you know, like animal yeah, parties. Yeah, but they don't get the exposure. Like, they're not on. Not like, yet. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, yeah, not yet. Be yeah. hopeful. Yeah. I mean, talking about ethical, I was um, obviously I watched the Game Changers. Yes. And then, um, obviously, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger in that. And then I saw footage of him giving out turkeys. Uh, yeah, not long after that, yeah. For Thanksgiving. I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, I'm also questioning the, the effectiveness, the validity of yeah, using someone, to, yeah, someone who's, who hasn't made the connection yet, you know, who's not vegan yet, to promote that. Because people yeah. then look, at, look up to that. Did you watch Game Changers? I did, I did, yeah. yeah. What did you think of it? I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's still helpful to drive the movement forward, but I mean, same with conspiracy, same with uh, what the health. I wouldn't call these like um, vegan movies, you know, because but they they are important. They're still important to dispel myth. It's an angle, know? isn't That's, it? It's an yeah. angle, yeah. yeah. That's their purposes, you know, like. Yeah. It doesn't make people go vegan, because like yeah. Yeah. Only only they can make themselves go vegan. I mean, it's, it's a plant-based documentary. Plant-based documentary, yeah. yeah. It's but it is still important for the yeah, movement yeah, because... Because it dispels a lot of the myths that people exactly. have about the health aspect, which exactly. is key for most people. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I had that as well, you know, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, before I, w I went vegan. So, yeah, people need to uh, be exposed to the right information, you know, to the truth. So, 
yeah, they have their roles to play. Yeah. And did you watch the? Uh, there was a podcast after with uh, Joe Rogan's podcast between yes. with him. James Wilkes, the Andrew. producer, and yeah. then there was Chris Cresser. Chris Cresser, yeah. The who's a I don't he's know, acupuncturist. I don't, yeah, I don't know like what his job an, is. Yeah. A nutritionist, yeah. yeah. But James Wilkes did a an excellent job, you know, like yeah, yeah with with his. Uh, I watched the whole thing. Yeah, the, oh, you did the three, three hours. hours and forty minutes of it, is it something like that. It's really long, yeah. and James Wilkes did an amazing job, obviously, mm-hmm. um, answering like Chris Cresser's. Mm-hmm it's called lies about nutrition and Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff but then in that podcast um, James Wilkes he's definitely advocating for a plant based diet he he, even within that he does say that he doesn't associate with vegans and um, yeah and he also said that we obviously we have vegans that are throwing um, blood on people wearing fur and he he disagrees with that and he thinks that people are crazy that are doing that He he says basically that yeah and even he admits that like, eating meat technically isn't wrong, but that you can thrive on it. I don't know, it's a bit of a weird debate for uh, me because Chris Cresser was basically just saying that you, can, you can't be healthy on a fully plant-based diet and you, can, you should have a little bit of animal products. So the argument was so f- small, really, between having a little bit of animal products and having none. And they weren't bringing in any ethical argument. It was just health. So it was, I don't know, for me, it wasn't that meaningful you know but the key point of that podcast is that Joe Rogan said you can be healthy can, yeah. on a vegan diet yeah. and the thing is they interchange the words vegan and, and, plant-based. and plant-based like mm. vegan diet plant-based diet yeah which it, it's very confusing and I, I do it as well and yeah. it's, it's kind of hard to keep that separation between the plant-based diet and then talking about the vegan lifestyle mm. yeah I think this is why this is the importance of um, animal liberation activists this is the importance of uh, studying the the ethics, you know, the foundation of, uh, yeah, of ethics, like have a great foundation, you know, of where we should be going. And uh, like, like I said, I think this has its own um, place in the movement, in the, in the fight, you know, like to dispel myth, you know, basically. But yeah, I suppose like uh, these people haven't fully, none of these people made yeah. the connection yet. And don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from James Wilkes. I think it is a great yes, exactly, documentary yeah. and he put thousands of hours into that. Yeah. And I thank him for that because yeah. it's had a huge impact on so many people to, to at least bring that conversation literally to the table. So, obviously when this episode is released, it's going to be early 2020, brand new year. Yeah, year. <laughs> What are your plans for 2020? Um, okay, 2020. There will be a vegan conference in China. Okay, wow. Yeah. And I will probably take part in that. Um, I would like to know what the vegan movement is like in China where is it going to be in China um, I forgot the name of the, the area yeah. <laughs> I would love to attend that that really. sounds super yes. interesting so yeah. World Vegan Organization has been um, hosting international vegan conferences this year I mean 2019 it was in India and I took part in that that was my very first in Indian trip and I met amazing activists and like amazing like business owners you know? and before that, in 2018, they hosted it in Japan, and the previous year it was in Taiwan. So this is an international conference where you know people from all over the world came together and like you know shared their knowledge. So yeah, um, there's a vegan conference in China. Um, there's a big demand now for um, vegan products in China because they had. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of accidental because they had the swine flu or something like that, so it kind of wiped out a lot of the right. meat production. So they turned to plant-based alternatives, so let's hope they, they, oh. they stick to it. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's brilliant news. Yeah. And um, what's your opinion on the the Impossible Burger? Right. <laughs> Speaking of uh, meat replacement products. Meat replacement, yes. Um, because they tested on animals, right? So yeah, they tested it on rats. And on rats, clearly against it. In their defense, mm-hmm. they advocate it as a plant-based burger. Yes, they're so clear enough on that. Yeah. yeah, so at least they got the claim right. Yes. We can't, we can't take that away from... Obviously, they did unnecessarily test on rats, so that doesn't make it vegan, they're not claiming it. Mm. But do you, does that mean, in your opinion, that we shouldn't support it today? Um, I personally don't support it. So the way I see it is like this. Yeah. Um, on the way to animal liberation... 
uh, people will do many different things, questionable things, and uh, maybe they believed it was right at the at the time. But us, like people who understand anti-speciesism, once we know that we don't need a burger to live, and they exploited animals in the development of this burger, we can thrive with other options. We shouldn't support it. Yeah. Many people believe it will, you know, like help achieve animal liberation. Um, the way I see it is, there's no evidence to support that. I think we can, you know, achieve animal liberation with or without uh, a product, any product really. You know, by the accepted definition of veganism, it is by definition not, not vegan. Yeah. Yeah, because just like uh, now, as a vegan, uh, as vegans, we wouldn't buy cosmetics tested on animals, right? Because it's part of the definition of veganism. Likewise, we wouldn't. Why we should we buy burgers tested on animals? Sure. Yeah, that, that, that makes actually perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, how about, for example, your KFC? They've brought in their yeah. own vegan options, plant-based options, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. McDonald's as well have their own. And a lot of the fast food chains are putting those options on the menu. What do you think about that? I think it's just part of the of the. Uh, progress because unfortunately yeah, most people are addicted to these fast food chains you know like and almost like almost uh, m- most societies run on these yeah. fast food chains and but for us who we know you know that we don't need any of this and we can even thrive on whole foods plant based why not support that instead you know why not support yeah I yeah, think if you if you have the choice definitely I, I, I choose to support 100% yeah vegan yeah. business oh, but yeah. sadly like there's not that many you know there's it's sm- they're small and even from even I can understand people coming in from a financial aspect ah, yeah. uh, often the smaller more ethical businesses are more expensive than right. like say the huge chains that obviously mass produce everything yes which right. keeps it quite so I do agree yeah it, yeah it can make it easier for many people right like to pick the plant-based options instead of the dead animal options yeah uh, I suppose yeah l- like I said like um Let's do the best we can, you know. Like, of course, people have different situations, but yeah, for for those of us who who can who can afford like whole foods, plant based, why not promote that instead? You know, like. Yeah, but definitely. I understand. Yeah, in many pe- in many cases, uh, with their financial si- situation, um, they can only afford like yeah cheap food. Then. Uh, go for the plant based options, you know, instead of the. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I always look at it kind of from that devil's advocate mm-hmm. kind of perspective of well if people are going to go there anyway ah right right then you know like at least it's on the menu at even if they don't the choose it being extremely negative yeah. then at least they see it you know at least it's actually there like yeah. it, the, it's a, you can't unsee what you've seen you know like the fact that there is a plant based option in these huge chains at least kind of makes things become a bit more normal you know and they get exposed to it yeah. it's kind of free advertising for it yeah. normalizing them yeah so for me it's like i i think i generally do support them like i don't i'm not going to say i support mcdonald's in any way uh, yeah. but i support them having these options yeah well i i see it as inevitable anyway you know yeah. like on because people are becoming more aware and they see Definitely. a market in it yeah. so i think it would happen sooner or later yeah but it doesn't mean that I should give my money to them. Or I should no, yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, the thing is, I felt so bad because I actually went, I was in Germany and um, I was so tired. And close to where I was staying, there was a McDonald's and they had the McVegan and I'd never tried it. Yeah. And honestly, it was pouring down with rain. Whatever. Anyway, I, I can find as many excuses as I want. But I went there and I ordered the McVegan because I, obviously I was curious as well. And I had it, like I ate it there as well. Yeah. And it just felt so weird, you know, like you're sitting there, ah, yeah. surrounded by people, and in, in McDonald's as well, you know, it's, um, ah, yeah. I don't know, it just felt really weird, like I felt quite awkward, I haven't actually been back since, I don't think. Okay. To be fair, like, let's be completely logical, to be logical and consistent, uh, I don't think it's an unethical thing to do, you know, like to, yeah. to buy from McDonald's, because um, um, a good friend of mine said, like, all money is blood money, somehow, like, even if we go to a vegan restaurant, fully vegan restaurants, they will have to pay s- their non-vegan employees, you know, like, so once we part with our money, it can be used for anything, for, it can be used for animal exploitation. So, um, um, that being said, yeah, there's no ethical difference buying, like, a vegan option from, you know, from these non-vegan chains or buying, um, 
yeah, or buying the vegan options from a vegan restaurant. You know, there's no ethical difference. Um, that being said, um, I think we can try to do our best. You know, like when we have the option to support like um, vegan restaurants, when we have the option to support, especially um, let's say like our friends' businesses. You know, like people who we know are ethical vegans. You know, why don't we uh, channel our yeah. money towards that? You know, like we can yeah still do our best. But I wouldn't say that it's unethical. You know, now we have the options. It's great. You know, like most many people can pick that instead of the yeah. and even non vegans are opening vegan restaurants just because they Absolutely. see it yes a market so in it right? technically yeah. you could even if you're going to get into like an ethical debate you yeah. could say is it ethical to go to a vegan restaurant that's owned by a non vegan because they're doing it for financial gain that's you know right. yeah and that's where it gets to a point where like we're never going to win if we focus on these things yes. you know yeah. like there's way bigger problems yes. and way bigger issues that we Absolutely. could be fighting for rather than focusing on that yeah. kind of stuff you know yeah ultimately in this society the best thing we can do is to purchase vegan items at the point of sale you know like, right yeah and yeah that's the best thing we can do yeah i mean so for far. me the one i'm struggling with is clothing clothing yeah 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 because i mean i first of all i don't really buy clothes you know like i just have clothes for like ever i don't even know where i got them from and i think it's a tough one for a lot of people because there's often a big price difference between the ethical sustainable organic clothes than just basically sweatshop stuff yeah. where you can get t-shirts for like a dollar you know what I mean uh, I remember I was when I was in Jakarta a few months ago like you go to the markets you can buy clothes for next to nothing that's true yeah. and so for people to make that step to make more sustainable and ethical choices when it comes to clothing I find that's almost harder than than food I think the same with food as well I think it becomes easier if we think of the victims I suppose. yeah that's yeah. true yeah. it's alright we do blind ourselves um, to human exploitation as well. I suppose, yeah. And that's why, like I said earlier, I'm always open to everyone's opinion because I'm sure there are like non-vegans out there who are doing so much amazing work for like um, sweatshop workers yeah, exactly. and all that kind of stuff. And that's why we do need to kind of unite on all of these causes. And But then it would make sense for them to be vegan as well. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Well, that's a good point, actually. I suppose it's good to uh, find common ground. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think technically anyone who's fighting for a cause is against exploitation or injustice. Everyone's fighting for justice. That's right, yes. Yeah. Of some yeah. form. That's our common that's ground. That's where justice. the common ground is. Yes. And that's what we agree on. And then some people choose to apply it to certain aspects of their life more than others. Or not at all to some aspects. I suppose, of yeah. Yeah. Like with veganism, we can agree that um, it's just like the moral baseline, you know, like it's the least anyone should... should yeah, do. I mean, that's why I'm always against, like, you know, the making heroes out of Vegas, being being a vegan you know like exactly, we yeah. shouldn't be we're not heroes for being vegan you know yes. i mean uh, it's just like you said it's the least we should be least doing do, yeah, yeah. and that everyone should be doing is they should be the weird ones we shouldn't be the heroes you yeah, know that's yeah. uh, oh, this is an important topic as well yeah. in the in the vegan community like how our language has shifted you know like, yeah we're absolutely not heroes you know like the the language now in the vegan community is that we are allies you know like they are agents of their own liberation. I think why it's important is because um, if we buy into this heroism, we can make the, this movement, veganism, about vegans when it's actually not about us. You know, like yeah. it might, might sound funny, but veganism is not about vegans at all. We always have to put the animals as the center of this movement. You know, yeah, it's it's very important aspects of it that we we do. I don't know. Sometimes even forget about like got to keep that focus in the right place and how like yeah it is about them it's not about us yeah. and helping each other grow and helping the movement grow especially i mean because ultimately let's be honest we're, we're not we're not winning you know like it's still uh, it's growing but still ultimately we're still a huge minority and there's still uh, so much work to be done absolutely uh, one thing that keeps me going uh, oh you asked earlier whether we would have a vegan world or not and the answer is we don't know right I, I believe that we will become more and more ethical, just like uh, we stamped out many forms of injustice. We still need to uh, work more on, you know, like injustice towards humans. But in many ways, you know, like we we um, we got rid of like injustices towards different races. You know, we've fought for um, men and wom women equality. You know, like and we we've uh, made. M we, we've come a long way, you know, since our uh, violent past. 
in regards to veganism, um, I think as long as humans live, as long as we exist, there will always be animal exploitation. Maybe we will de decrease it massively. But what keeps me going is not uh, the idea that we, we will someday have a vegan world or like these lofty goals. What keeps me going is the individuals. Because um, I've been in farms, I've been in slaughterhouses, I've connected with many individuals that um, I couldn't save. You know. But if we make just one change, you know, like even uh, if we can encourage someone to make just one small decision change, let's say, um, they decide not to, um, uh, they decide to go for a vegan option, for a vegan burger instead of the non-vegan burger. Um, that's, they're spa sparing, not saving, yeah, but sparing the life of one animal, at least. And to that animal, that means everything, that means the world. And if we can, let's say, rescue even one chicken from a factory farm, that means the world to that one chicken. Um, so it's the individuals who keep me going, you know, like, because... Um, I think that's a very yeah. important point that you say about the individuals, because we yeah. focus on mass numbers. Exactly. We quote numbers. 70 billion land yeah. animals, we quote 3 trillion uh, sea animals, we quote, you know, massive numbers that don't really mean anything to anyone and then if, if we focus on those huge numbers like what impact are you really going to have on 70 billion land animals but like the fact that you brought up the aspect that to that single animal that is yeah. its whole world and that's its life that that is a true impact absolutely that's what keeps me going yeah. because I've I've met many individuals who wh whom I couldn't save whom no one could save you know who are lost but um, and to them yeah that's their whole lives lost you know like and uh, but there are still like millions, billions more individuals whom we can, we could spare, you know, this life of misery. We could spare, you know, great suffering. So I think we need to keep going for them, you know, like yeah. for for the next ones, you know, like and to use like the story of uh, the animals who got exploited and murdered to save the next ones, I suppose, yeah, because here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, each individual's life matters to them as much as mine does to me. Yeah, exactly. Does to you. What's your favorite animal? At the moment, it's a uh, pig. Really? It's pig, yeah. Why? Pig. Because they're intelligent. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, that was the last animal I, uh, I've taken footage of in slaughterhouses. Yeah. And whenever I come to the UK, I go to the sanctuary. And I always had a great time with the pigs. And yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, you still need to be careful, you know, because they, they can be dangerous animals. Yeah, they're big, but, you know, yeah, they're strong massive, animals. Yeah. Strong, yeah. But they're also very, they can be gentle. They can be, yeah. And they love scratches, you know, like whenever you scratch them, they just uh, fall on their sides. <laughs> yeah, they love affection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you make that real connection with an animal and you spend time with any animal, be that the uh, chicken, mm -hmm. Uh, be that pigs, be that horses, and then you make that real connection that wow, these are live sentient beings that love and feel and have their own like cognitive system and feelings. Then you're like, yeah, that, you can't put a price on that. You know, you can't slice it up and put it in a supermarket on a, sh on a shelf and say like, this is what your life is. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That being said, like in advocacy, many people try to use like uh, our similarities, right? Like, oh, animals love their families. Animals love cuddle, but. Uh, ultimately, and there are a lot of ways that they are like us, but ultimately that's not the reason we should respect, you know, their life, you know. Like, um, I mean, there are animals that that I don't like either, you know, and, and as you know, like, we don't need to like animals, we don't need to be animal lovers. I'm to allergic to most animals. To yeah, most exactly. Animals. <laughs> so, like, some animals are slimy, some yeah. animals, like, kill each other in the wild, but it doesn't uh, give us justification to exploit them you know yeah so yeah ultimately i think that's why a lot of people um, struggle to stop eating fish because they don't make that connection fish, yeah. with fish in the same way that we might do with uh, mammals and land animals yeah. So, yeah. but yeah what if like we can educate people from a young age that you know it doesn't matter uh, how different they are from you you know their lives their lives matter to them yeah. you know as much as yours and i think that would make a huge impact even on a human level in society just that whole aspect if you remove discrimination between animals on your plate then you're going to find it a lot easier to say some, to consider someone who doesn't look like you or you're not going to discriminate either 
Because if, say, it's okay to eat chickens, but you, you don't have to love dogs, then what if someone tells you, like, oh, don't like Indonesian people, for example, but then be nice to European people, you're kind of removing discrimination from such a young age. You Absolutely, know? yeah. And I think that can, that can be very powerful. And I would be very curious to see, like, a whole generation of vegan children grow up and see what kind of society they have. Absolutely, yeah. That's what Gary Urofsky said, right? Yeah. This, um, speciesism is the first level of discrimination you are taught you know, yeah. from a young age. That's why I'm, I'm very hopeful for the future of um, these vegan schools. There are several vegan schools already in Indonesia. One of them just opened this year in Jakarta. It's called What's Maitreya, a vegan school? Maitreya School. Uh, it means um, all the meals, everything in the school is vegan. Okay. Yeah. There's also one in, in Bali, actually. Like no way. It's attached to the Fortunate Coffee in Denpasar. But does it, is it part of the education as well, or is it just... Part of the education, yeah. Okay, well... Uh, yeah, to respect nature, you know, to respect animals. Yeah. I think it's part of this, um, like, group or movement called Loving Nature right. that originated in Taiwan. You know, like. I'll have to go there next time. Yeah, yeah. I'll be, you um, visit it, I'd, yeah. I'd love to visit it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It gives you hope, you know, because I think, obviously, um, it's a big aspect for a lot of people. It's, okay, you're going to have children. Like, what's the world going to be? Like, what world are you putting your children into? And yeah, then exactly. you raise your children vegan, obviously because you're compassionate and you care for animals, you care for the environment, but obviously you're going to care for your child and you want them to have a world to live in. You know? Absolutely, yeah. And if you decide to have children, which is... Yeah, that's... It's an entire, yeah, this is a good topic. Yeah, to do you don't want to have kids? Sorry? What's your thought on having children? Oh, I might. I mean, I have uh, fur babies already adopted. Yeah, <laughs> adopted in shop. But oh, you, you mean human children? Human children, human, human children. children. No. Biological children? No. no. biological children, no. no. Yeah. Why not? Uh... Shall we get into that? Yeah, let's, yeah, why do, not? It. <laughs> let's do it. Might yeah. as well. When I first got into it, it's a bit like veganism. Uh, I first got uh, came to this decision from an environmental perspective. You know, how many how many of us are here now? Seven billion, almost eight. Pushing eight, yeah. Pushing I think eight, seven point yeah. seven billion is uh, the exactly. latest statistic that I saw. And we uh, and we uh, have massive consumption, right? We consume so much, you know, and like uh, adding another, even even with the best case scenario where they grow up to be vegan and an activist, you know, try to be zero waste, we still need to consume a lot, right? We still use up resources. We still uh, pollute the environment in some ways. So if I can prevent that, you know, just one more and have that awareness already, then why not? So... Um, but if good people like you stop having kids, then what about the... Who's going to take care of the world, you right, know? Right, so... What that's that's my that. dilemma. That's yeah, when it comes what I would to, ask yeah. is that, um, are your parents vegan? No. Not yet. Probably. My mum is pretty much uh, 100% vegan, I right. think so now. My dad is getting closer by the day. Right, so were you raised vegan? No. Yeah, neither was I. Yeah. But we came to, to be vegan. And I suppose most vegans nowadays were not raised vegans either. True. But they still, we still came to the same conclusion. So I think the, the values that we like from each other these are taught values you know these are we we acquire these values through education you know and not through genetics true that's yeah. what I realized and uh, um, yeah I think how we pass on these values is not through genetics but through yeah I think education. that's where the education aspect is coming through yeah you, you, yeah you are right actually so in that regard um, when we have children in need still you know when we have when we still have orphans who need homes, and if we have the the um, the capacity, the resources to give them loving homes, to educate them, to respect um, their surroundings, to respect the planet, and respect other animals, why wouldn't we focus on that first? So that's one aspect, right? Like the environmental aspect, and then second, um, the so uh, yeah, I have like three victims that uh, led me to this decision the environmental aspect which is like the, the wild animals right somehow they, they can be victims from from our existence from human yeah. existence a second um, there's no guarantee that they will remain vegan so ad, as you know like children might rebel you know like and there's no guarantee that no, but I'm not even yeah. talking about them them being vegan at this point I'm oh, talking right. about you know just being genuinely good people you yeah, know like people. To, oh, yeah, exactly. yeah, that's mainly like the, the aspect of it that I'm Obviously, vegan is a big part of that, but yes. just genuinely good humans. Because yeah. 
I mean, obviously, I consider, like, will or not I have children for exactly the same reasons that you've mentioned. Mm. And But then I feel like, yeah, there is a need to, like, educate another generation yes. mm. to, to help guide our planet continually towards a better future as well. I mean, obviously, yeah, you can do that through adoption and through educating other people that aren't your children. That's, yep, a, that's exactly. a very, very valid point, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, regarding that as well, like, I mean, of course, like, veganism is part of it, right? Veganism is part of them. And there's no guarantee that uh, they won't like st- uh, start exploiting animals, you know, like you know through non-veganism. Yeah. So even that it already is a gamble, you know, like you're gambling on on animal lives. And thirdly, the third victim is the the child itself. You know, like uh, many people many people think about um, how they want their child to live. You know, but have we ever thought um, in what manner w- would we like our children to die? Because that's a certainty. Wow. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and many people die what would be called uh, an unpleasant death, you know, like a painful death, you know, like, and um, and you know, for us already here. By the way, doesn't mean that I have a a bleak outlook on life. You know, I yeah. I am very grateful for my life. I try to make the best of it. You know, and I and I can say that about my life. I mean, you didn't choose to be here, did you? You didn't choose yeah, exactly. to. Yeah, you didn't choose yeah. to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, but. Uh, what right do I have to impose that on another life, you know, on a human being? That's that's my my take on it. So yeah, the three victims are like the the wild animals, the environment, the the uh, direct victims, the animals who are directly exploited yeah. through non-veganism, and thirdly the child itself, because we never know how, you know, how happy or like how. Yeah, how that's a, you, their, it's their a massive is, risk, yeah. isn't it? Actually, if you think about it, when you're putting out a child into into this world, I mean, especially yeah. uh, with the world, the a lot of people aren't now. happy as well in this world. A lot of people exactly. aren't happy with their lives. And Ultimately, I just find it a gamble, and I'm, yeah. and I'm not justified in gambling on so many lives. You know, it's true. It has a massive but, impact. Yeah. To be fair, like this message is received even less than veganism. You know, it's harder for people to receive this message. You know, like uh, even vegans. You know, like. Uh, and what I found is that, um, but I know you're familiar with many of the excuses here. Many vegans, even when, when, when they hear this message, they start to use the same excuses, like, but it's natural, you know, like, yeah. you know, but, uh, it's a natural thing. When, when our goal is not to, to seek what's natural, right? We want to seek what is ethical, right? Like, and uh, for many people, like, veganism is about reducing suffering. And uh, I think not creating children is part of reducing suffering. You know, it's something that anyone can do. You know, it's just a simple decision. And just like veganism, it's a non-action, right? Yeah. It's a non-action. True, yeah. true. But then what would be action on that? Sorry? What would be the action? On the action is on deciding to, yeah. to breed. <laughs> yeah, true. Whereas, yeah, ve- non-veganism is the action to exploit animals, to buy animal yeah. products. Yeah. So, but yeah, because... Just like just like veganism, ma- many people don't even think about eating animals or like eating animal products. With with breeding as well, like in society, it's almost a, a norm. Like that, people don't even think of it as a as an active action anymore. People just think it's just the way of life. Or oh, some someday we will, I will have um, children. You know, someday I will bear children. Yeah, there's a whole social pressure with everything. Social it's pressure, uh, yeah. oh. Uh, when are you going to get married? Yes. When are you going to buy a house? Yeah. When are you going to have kids? Uh, when are you going to I don't know, settle down? Are you going to get a real job? When are you going to die? You know, like exactly. Literally yeah. just goes on forever, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 But it's about questioning, right? Like we can come back to yeah. questioning. Uh, yeah. yeah. Our actions. And also, honestly, yeah. I do believe we should question everything. Everything, including yeah. including veganism. I do think we should question it mm-hmm. constantly because there's nothing wrong with questioning it if you're right. You know, if you know that it's the right thing to do, if you know it's the ethical thing to do you should have no issue in questioning it. That's right. When yeah. people say, don't question it, for me, then it's like, you're hiding something from me. There's yeah. something that I shouldn't know, I shouldn't be aware of. Yeah. But I think it's very important to question every decision. Yes. Are there times that you doubt, like, being vegan? No, not being vegan. Because the way I see it, being vegan is like a non-action, right? So yeah. you don't necessarily question not doing something, you know, if I don't need to do something. Because there's, like, a wide range, like, it's infinite, right? What The things we don't do, so, yeah, veganism is like abstaining from something, right? Like, and if you don't need to, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, of course I do question it, but it's very quick that I come to the conclusion that yeah, it is the right truth. You know, like me not uh, buying tortured animal flesh. Like, no one can make me do that. You know, like and nothing. There's no reason to do that anyway. So it's. Very I mean, quick. yeah, I always say it, it always comes down to the same thing. Like, if it's not necessary, yes. Why are we doing it? You know, like why inflict so much harm? Why inflict so much pain? Exactly. Yeah. When you don't have to. Mm-hmm. What's the point? Yeah. Like, that's really the thing that I don't I don't get. I question actions more than non-actions, right? So, yeah, the action part, of course, I do question a lot, like, like, um, <laughs> like whether I should fly less. In fact, like, uh, some of my vegan friends inspired me to look into it, you know, like, <laughs> um, I don't know, it's different for everyone, right? Everyone has different situations. Mm, I don't know what action I will take more, but um, I do intend in 2022 look into flying less you know like probably like when i go back to jakarta i will take the uh, ferry and train instead yeah but that's the hard thing isn't it i mean once you kind of get this ball rolling yeah it just never stops and no. it keeps growing and you want to do more and more which is great yeah and obviously i would i would say to people do as much as you can and continue doing more mm-hmm. but then it can become overwhelming as well can't it you know to kind of always trying to do more and more and more and yeah. it's so easy to point fingers at yourself or to point fingers at people that Others. are taking action, that are trying to do yes, something. Whereas right. when you do nothing and you're like, I don't give a shit, you know, like, yeah. I don't care, the planet's fucked, we're all going to die, yeah. it's all over, then no one cares what you do if you fly six times a year or whatever, you know. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We are very hard. Probably. I think so, I'm yeah. very afraid of the judgment of each other and especially even within vegan community, you know. Oh, like, yeah. When you're going to meet another vegan, um, it's almost like, you're trying to show like how vegan you exactly, are like yeah, how, yeah, who's absolutely. the most vegan you know like, absolutely yeah and I whereas know. like we all have tried like much more than the general population probably you know yeah, like, yeah. although it, uh, we shouldn't think that way I mean we should always like aim for more progress you know like but I think yeah it's, it, there needs to be a balance yeah. you know where and it's in human can, nature as well human I mean, it yeah. is probably yeah I mean I see myself doing it you know like I don't know I'll see like a vegan fr- a good friend of mine I post something and then there'll be like a plastic straw. I'm like, ha! <laughs> you, know, ah, like, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's dumb, it's dumb stuff. It's but stupid. Yeah. It makes no sense. But you know, there's just that, there's absolutely no competition no, no, between no us. Competition, and then yeah. I don't know why we're always trying to prove mm. to other people that kind of stuff. You know, it's like we have to be confident and happy with what we're doing and knowing why we're doing something yeah. and to be as impactful as possible. Absolutely, yeah. But I suppose like uh, these things can be phrased differently. I think when we try to do that, we should always like phrase it as a constructive criticism, you know, like instead of like trying to tear each other down. Yeah, yeah. Unless, unless you're just joking yeah, around yeah, with yeah. your mates, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it can be a positive thing, you know, like. But yeah, I think we, we need to focus on communication, clear communication, constructive criticism, and if our intention is to lift each other up, like saying, "Oh, hey, you can do better," you know, yeah. like with this, you know, like, then uh, it can be very positive, you know. Like, yeah, of course, but yeah. I mean. It's always seen as negative, isn't it, in the society? Like if you yeah. if you fail or do something wrong, we yeah. see it very bad. The negative, and we yeah. don't allow ourselves to fail. Whereas I think failure yeah. is part of everything, you yeah, know, part of, part learning, of progress, yeah. and you yeah. can only learn when you fail. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the way that's we important. should move forward, really, with these things. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been at this for a very long long time now. It's been a good fun episode, sitting outside, uh, lounging. Uh, if you if you aren't watching this on YouTube and you're listening to it, um, we're sitting in some very comfortable chairs on top of a. Rooftop, rooftop balcony so we've yeah. been enjoying our time up here with a gorgeous view of the island <laughs> yeah it is a beautiful island it is a beautiful island and Just if you had one last thing to say to the person who's listening who's been also first of all thank you for listening to an hour and over an hour and a half of this and then second of all it's a person who's almost vegan they want to be vegan but they're holding back just a little bit something holding them back what would you say to them um Always keep in mind the animals because the difference between someone who thinks that vegan is hard and vegan is easy is that those who think vegan is easy are thinking of the animals whereas those who think veganism is hard is thinking of themselves. Just uh, try to live more mindfully and uh, tap into your empathy because I believe we all have empathy. We are all capable of putting ourselves in others' shoes. So uh, think how it must feel like to be the victims. So, uh, yeah, uh, take the leap, you know, have faith. And in this day and age, don't be afraid to ask for help. There's always someone who wants to help you 
yeah. you know, especially with uh, on the internet. Yeah, online you know, platforms online or even platform. in the home cities and Absolutely, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. stuff everywhere for this. Yeah. Reach out for help. Definitely. Alden, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having it me. It was so much fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Plant Code Podcast. I'll be back next week. Don't know where I'll be. Don't know who I'll be with. But I'm sure it will be fun. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. That's the year that they're saying's our last Unless we make a change now when we gotta be fast But first we gotta make a shift in what we put in our mouths These silly billies thinking vegans eating grass on the ground We talking fast food, yo, it's burgers and fries And it used to hurt the earth and the birds in the sky But now they making it with plants and it's so much better Cause the animals are safe, no more changes in the weather We better act fast cause the ice barely freezing The world's changing quick, so welcome to Planet Vegan Woo! Damn man, can you feel that? This place is getting hot! If we want to save the world, it'll take some work. If you want to make it better, then take off your shirt, wave it around your head, and jump into the streets. The revolution starts now. Can you feel its heartbeat? If we want to save the world, man, we better be quick. Because we're killing all the piggies and the cows and the chicks. And I got to be honest, I ain't a fan of our fate. But we can make a change now, and it starts on our plates. All around the world, it's a brand new dance. What you're making out of bodies, yeah, we're making out of plants. We got to save the pigs and the fishes in the sea. So hold on to your pants, plant a vegan soon to be. There's a change up in the system, I can feel it in the air. But if benefits us all, there's no need to be scared. We're going to change the world, and we'll do it in a day. So don't fight the future, planet vegans here to stay. If we want to save the world, it'll take some work. If you want to make it better, then take off your shirt, wave it around your head, and jump into the streets. The revolution starts now. Can you feel its heartbeat? If we want to save the world, man, we better be quick. Because we're killing all the piggies and the cows and the chicks. And I got to be honest, I ain't a fan of our fate. But we can make a change now when it starts on our plates. Massive forest fires have once again decimated the Californian coastline. Iceland just held a funeral for the first glacier ever lost in the country's history due to warming weather patterns. Europe was just hit with the hottest temperatures in recorded history. Thousands of people are already dying every year from climate change related issues and this number is expected to rise exponentially over the coming decade okay this apocalyptic nightmare is about to be real forest fires oceans flood and let it fill you with fear a billion refugees running across the borders in pain and they're drowning while you're saying you're refusing to change slaughterhouses filled with bodies and they're letting out screams but you're saying it's a lie that it's only a dream let me tell you something man the nightmare is real and you're paying for it daily with your supersized meal